Good evening, church family. Side up to the screen, and I got an image on the screen. And I'd like to just ask the question, what do you see? That's a, in that image that I have up, what do you see? Does it make any sense to you? Give me an answer. What do you see? Looks like California. Boy, this isn't an art interpretation class, but that's a good one right there. What, what do you see? What's another answer or two? You see a lot, a lot of things, don't you? Did somebody say a boiled egg? That's a good one. Okay. <laughs> All right, so let me just tell you that what you see there on the screen is a very, uh, very old painting uh, that you will certainly recognize if you saw a clearer picture of it. Uh, let me zoom out just a little bit and just see. What do you see there? Okay. Does anybody, if you've said the name of the painting, then I didn't hear you, so I'm going to keep going. Well, you ruined my point. <laughs> okay, let me just tell you that when I look at this image, I don't know how well you can see on, it's a little less clear on the screen as it is on my phone. But what I see here, when I, and I actually have never seen this and as a part of this painting, there is uh, water, there is a bridge, and if you look real closely, you're probably not going to be able to see it here behind me, there seems to be a man standing on that bridge. Now, I couldn't see that back at this image, but when I zoomed out just a little bit, I did see it on this image. And uh, Garrett has rightly identified that what we're looking at is over the left shoulder of the Mona Lisa, a very famous painting, as I said. And right there where that circle is, is about the area that I zoomed in at. I show you that not because I'm greatly interested in art. I really probably am not that interested in art. But I tell you what I am interested in. I'm interested in the point that I think this has to, to give us, and that is that when we look at something so zoomed in, separated from its context, it's very hard to identify what we're looking at, isn't it? We can misinterpret it. You know, when I first looked at that, if I were to go back a little bit, when I first looked at that, I just saw a whole bunch of nothing. I would have said there's a few variety of colors there. And then when you go out one more, I can probably see that there is a bridge, but I probably would have interpreted the darker colors on the left-hand side of the image as a mountain or a hill of sorts. And it isn't until you zoom out considerably when you really know what you're looking at. It really isn't. And so that point is made just to, to, to kind of get us started with the idea of the lesson this evening and something that I want to think about, not just this evening, but all year long, and that is that context matters. Context matters. We probably all have seen this play out in society in some form or fashion, how that somebody is accused of saying something that is not acceptable by society standards, and you think, that's just awful. How? Why would that person ever say that? And then you go and look at it more closely, and you realize, no, the news media, they ripped out of context what that man or woman has said. They put a headline above it that was very misleading, but when you only see a five-second clip of a two-hour-long video, or when you see just a sentence out of a whole manuscript full of statements, then you understand how easy it is to take something out of context. You know, they say a picture is worth a thousand words. Something like that, right? And when I think about that statement, I'm reminded that the Bible has 783,000 words. And what the Bible is, it is God's self-portrait of Himself. 
It is God, if you will, in a sense, giving us a, a, a portrait of who He is, what He is about, and how He wants us to respond to that information. And so when we are talking about taking the Bible in context, I know that that might sound boring to some, but I think it's an important discussion to be had. And so I want to have that discussion with you this evening. I would suggest that we read the Bible, that we study the Bible, that we spend time thinking about the Bible. I hope that every person in this room has that desire, has that zeal. And at the beginning of the year, if you're anything like me, you kind of hit the reset button and you think, maybe I'll give that an attempt this year that I wasn't greatly successful at last year. And so I want to read and study the Bible, and that's good. But in the midst of our reading and studying and thinking about the Bible, may I offer this warning, may we try our very best not to, may we do our best not to fail to see the forest for the trees. Does that make sense? Here's a common scenario. You take a passage, we're trying to understand the passage, and we just want to read that verse or those two verses or those three verses, but we haven't yet taken time to think about how that fits into the overall context of the Bible. That's what I want to discuss with you this evening. And so, with that being said, I want to share with you in this lesson uh, seven points, or rather it's more like this, seven steps that I think are necessary for us to take in order to understand the Bible correctly. And that is to take it in its context. I'm just going to get right to it. In step number one, I want to recommend to you that we first understand the purpose of the Bible itself. I think sometimes the very purpose of the Bible is misunderstood. We think, well, the Bible is a book primarily giving us a road map to heaven. I've heard that said. Now, is there a sense in which that's true? Yes. But I don't believe, first and foremost, that's what the Bible is. Does it accomplish that? Why, certainly it does. And so I don't want you to quote me or think that I'm saying the Bible is not our GPS. It is not our roadmap to heaven because it is. But that is not the primary function of the Bible. I would suggest to you the Bible has three primary functions, and that is number one, uh, to address, is to address these three questions. Number one, who is God? Number two, I would suggest that the Bible is answering the question, what has God done for us? And number three, how does God want me to live? That's the three main questions under consideration. And that first question, who is God, is primarily what the Bible is given to us for. And so with that being said, let's just consider that a little further. You probably know that Psalm 19 verse number one famously says that the heavens do what? Declare the glory of God. There's, there's something very interesting what the psalmist is saying there. He's saying that you can look at the sun, moon, and stars. You can see nature. You can see the physical creation. And you can determine that there is a creator. There is a God. In other words, the psalmist very poetically says that the creation shouts that there is a God. But you know, if we want to get to know that God, we can't do that through nature. Not only. And so the point that is under consideration here is that the only... I can know that there is a God by creation, but I cannot know who that God is, what He is like, and all of His qualities and attributes. I just can't know that. And so the Bible, in a very real sense, is God writing us a letter, putting it on terms we can understand human language, and He puts... He doesn't just give us a list of thou shalt and thou shalt nots. He is giving us a story. He is in a very historical, chronological fashion with big pictures and big themes in mind. He is telling us who He is in story form and it's real life events. And here's what I love about what the Bible does. The Bible does address who God is. I can know that there is a God through nature. I get to know who that God is and develop a personal relationship with Him through His Word. That's where the Bible comes in, where I want to get to know Him. The Bible tells me that God is a spirit, John 4, 24. 
The Bible tells me that, that God is first and last. There was no one before Him, nor will there be anyone after Him. Isaiah 44 verse 6. The Bible tells me that the one true God is comprised of three persons, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Matthew 28, you remember in the Great Commission, and you shall baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. I would also give you 2 Corinthians 13, 14 as a reference to that. The Bible tells me that the God, the Creator God, our, the one true God, He is all-knowing, 1 John 3 and verse number 20. He is all-powerful, John 1, 1 through 3, He created all things. Things. I don't have time in this lesson to really go into great detail about what the Bible says God is or who God is. That's a, a deeper lesson. We could, we could have a lesson every night of the year. I believe this is a rare year in that we have 53 Sundays in 2023. And uh, so with that being said, we could spend every lesson on Sunday nights here to the end of the year talking just about who God is. His qualities, His attributes, what makes Him Him. But I would just recommend, because I don't have time to do that this evening, own a Bible, read a Bible, spend much time in the Bible, and do so not because, well, I'm looking for a devotional thought today that will help me deal with the hardships of the day. I suppose that's well and good, but don't confuse that with Bible study. Or, or I just need to kind of get my emotions set correctly before I... Okay, that's fine. The, the, the Psalms serve that purpose in a major way. But don't confuse that with what the journey we are to take, and that is a journey to get to know intimately this God who created us and saves us. And so, um, there's 783,000 words in this Bible... Uh, God is do, using a lot of words to try to explain who He is to us so that we can get to know Him. And so the point that I have there on the screen is seek to understand the purpose of the Bible. The first purpose is to know God. The second purpose is to know what God has done. And in a nutshell, Genesis 12, 1 through 4 says that God prepared a nation so that from that nation He could bring about a Messiah, a Savior, and that Son, Jesus Christ, He freely offered upon the cross for our sins. And Jesus willfully, I'm sorry, willingly went to the cross, voluntarily went to the cross for our sins, that's John 3.16 and that's Romans 5.8. But I want to put a peg here and look at Romans 8 and verse 32 for just a moment. Here's a verse that I want to add to this discussion that I often overlook. That's Romans 8 and verse number 32. Notice here what Paul says concerning Jesus being given as a sacrifice for our sins. Romans 8.32, the Bible says, He who did not spare His Son, but delivered Him up for us all, how shall, he, how shall He not with Him also freely give us all things? I love this statement in verse 32 that says, The Father did not spare His Son. Another way of putting that is that the Father did not hold back. So the Bible addresses that second question, what has God done for you and I? What has He done for humanity? In short, He held back nothing from us. And when God demands our full-hearted commitment, may we not hold back anything from Him either. The Bible continues to say that the Son will willingly laid down His life on the cross, sacrificing Himself, but that the Spirit inspired holy men of God to write God's Word in human language, 2 Peter 1 and verse number 21. That, those words have been preserved for us today, and it is contained in the book that we call the Bible. He provides for all humans both sunshine and rain, Jesus said in Matthew 5 verse 45. He provides salvation to those who are in Christ. And so that leads to the third purpose of the Bible, and that is how does God want us to live? In short, He wants us to respond to Him in faith, for without it we cannot please God, Hebrews 11.6. He wants us to fear Him and keep His commandments, Ecclesiastes 12.13. And I love the way Jesus summarized it when He said, We love God with everything we have. Our heart, soul, strength, and mind, Mark 12 and verse number 30. So that's the first step. 
Everything I read, the way I interpret a passage, the way I apply the Scriptures, the way I understand this book, it has to fall under the umbrella of what the purpose of the Bible is to begin with. You know, this book is accurate when it comes to history, but it's not a history book. That's not its purpose. This book even has medical statements listed, especially there in the Pentateuch, and it's accurate, but it's not a book of medicine, is it? This is a love letter from God saying, you may have noticed that I exist because of my creation. I want to get to know you and I want you to get to know me. This is where we start. That's what the Bible is. Everything should be interpreted and viewed under that umbrella. Observation number two or step number two is it is important if we're seeking to take the Bible in context to understand the chronological timeline of the biblical events. In other words, know that Cain comes before Noah. And know that Noah comes before Abraham. Know that Moses came after Joseph, but he came before David. Now, I know that sounds simple and fundamental, but so many false teachings arise by failing to understand these things. Know that the ministry of Christ took place while the Levitical system was still in effect but that his actual teachings are applying to something that are future-oriented, and that is the time of the church. Know that the Old Testament covers about 1,500 years, whereas the New Testament covers about 100 years. All of these things will aid in our Bible understanding. Not knowing this will inevitably get us in trouble when it comes to understanding the Bible. For example, let me give you an example. If we know that the kingdom of Israel was united under Saul and David and Solomon, and if we know that after Solomon's reign, the kingdom of Israel split in half, so that is split in two kingdoms, and now you have the northern kingdom, which is Israel, and you have the southern kingdom, which is Judah, just knowing the timeline of the Bible will clear up a whole lot of confusion. For instance, what book am I reading? Where does it fall in the timeline? When I read of Israel, is it talking about united Israel, which included Jerusalem? Or is it talking about divided Israel, it's only known as Israel, which does not include Jerusalem? Does that make sense? And it's interesting to note that during the divided kingdom, there was never a time when the northern kingdom, Israel, was faithful to God. There were many occasions when the southern kingdom, Judah, was faithful to God. So understanding this in where, you know, if I'm reading Genesis, that doesn't apply. If I'm reading 1 Samuel, that doesn't necessarily apply up until the time of King Saul. And so this is important, I think, understanding the chronological timeline of biblical events. To give a New Testament perspective to it, I would say it's not a good idea to start reading and studying the book of Acts without first having the foundation of the ministry of Jesus for instance. So we could delve into that with more detail later. Here's a third observation. Understand the three dispensations. I'm going to give you some practical reasons why this is a good idea. There are three dispensations or periods of time that are very important when we try to understand the Bible in its context. One of those, is, and the first of those, is the patriarchal age. And then you have the Mosaic Age, and then you have the Church Age, or the Christian Age. Let's talk about those very briefly. The Patriarchal Age is just that. It is a time and a period when God communicated His will directly to individual families, but through the Father, through the Patriarch. And that would have included, say, that if you were, if, if during Isaac's lifetime, if Abraham were still living, Abraham was the patriarch, not Isaac, even after uh, he would have started his own family, though it didn't work out quite that way. And so in, it's important to note that the patriarchal age, we have no reason to believe that God was only speaking to Abraham in this way. It seems that whether you were a Jew, which really hadn't existed yet, or a Gentile, the patriarchal system worked the same across the board. There was no distinction between Jew and Gentile at that time. 
And I would also note that it seems as though that for the Gentiles, this patriarchal system continued all the way until the time of the Christian age. For instance, in Acts chapter 10, we come across a Gentile who God communicates directly to. This is after the New Testament history has begun. This is after the 33 years of Jesus' earthly life. This is after the church was established, and that's Cornelius in Acts chapter 10. And so... That gets us to the second dispensation or age, and that is the Mosaic Age. And that covers the period of time from when God gave the law in written form on Mount Sinai all the way until the church age began. And so I put it that way because there's a few things that need to be understood about the Mosaic Age. And that is one, it was not given universally to every human. It was given to the Jewish nation only. So therefore, if a Gentile were to come along in that age or in our age and start trying to implement things from the Levitical system or the Law of Moses, the Old Testament primarily, they would actually be wrong whether they did that before Christ or after Christ unless they became proselytes and became Jews, of course. And so this is important because the third section is the church age, and that is the Christian age. So to recap, God spoke directly to the fathers during the patriarchal age. He spoke directly to the nation of Israel through written law. It started out with 10 commandments and grew into over 300 commandments. He does this in the Mosaic age. And then in the church age, you remember what Hebrews chapter 1 verses 1 through 4 says? God has... Now, I'm going to paraphrase it, communicated at various times and in various ways and has spoken to our fathers through the prophets, but has in these last days spoken to us through who? His through His Son, Jesus Christ. And so that's significant. In other words, there is a difference in the age in which we're living in and the age that Jesus lived in, for instance. And there is a difference in the age that Jesus lived in and the age that Abraham lived in. They are different dispensations. A failure to understand this distinction will lead to people trying to implement tithing today, trying to honor the Sabbath day today, uh, trying to, uh, to implement other uh, points of the Levitical system, such as using harps and lyres and instruments when singing praises to God. That was a temple worship practice only. Even the Jewish people, the Old Testament is chock full of passages, not only citing that they used instrumental music to praise God, but commanding them. David commanded the children of Israel in the temple worship to praise God with harps and lyres, a type of instrument. So they did so. But the early Jews, when the, they were separated from the temple, when they were away in exile, they didn't use instrumental music. The early Christians modeled their worship after the synagogue practice. In the days of Jesus, you remember he would visit synagogues. Paul would do the same. Because they were not in the temple, they never would have thought to offer an animal sacrifice in the synagogue. That was temple worship. They never would have thought to light incense in the synagogue. They never would have thought to use harps and lyres in the synagogue. This was all isolated to what we, we would know as as Levitical worship. And so knowing that gives us the context, well, it makes all the sense in the world that the New Testament says, speaking to ourselves psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody where? In our hearts to the Lord. Revelation says that the incense of the saints today is our prayers. The, the, the Bible calls the cross of Jesus on one occasion the altar. Levitical worship had an actual altar, had actual incense, had uh, uh, instruments you would play in psalms. All of that was turned into a more spiritual direction sometime later. Here's a fourth observation, understanding the two testaments. And I told you I had a lot to cover, so I'm going to speed this up a bit. You know there is an Old Testament. And you know there is a New Testament. And because of the way the Bible's organized, it's pretty easy to understand what is what. But I think sometimes we fail to remember that when we're, we're reading the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, though that is New Testament, that's still under the Old Testament system. Not the teachings, but the events. Does that make sense? And so understanding this distinction, the Old Testament was for Jews. I'm talking about the Law of Moses and the Prophets. They were for the Jews, the Jewish people, the Jewish nation, and that law was perfect for the intent it was given. We're going to read a passage in a moment that I think that statement is important. 
And uh, the law of Moses was perfect for the intent that it was given, but it was never intended to make us complete. It was never intended to bring salvation. It was only meant to preserve a nation, prepare a nation for the coming of the Messiah. The New Testament, on the other hand, or sometimes called the gospel, it is a message, it is a law, the law of Christ, that can save us of our sins. Romans 1.16, Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. The Old Testament didn't have that power. Go with me very quickly in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 7. We read this this morning in our Bible class, but I want to read it for this point here. And I want you to just have a little context of Hebrews 7. What he's discussing is how that Christ is superior. What he's discussing here in Hebrews 7 is how that Christ is the high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Without getting into it, he's saying that Christ's priesthood is superior to the priesthood of the Levites. That's what he's saying. When we get to verses 11 and 12 of Hebrews 7, he connects the priesthood of the Old Testament, the Levitical priesthood, to the old law. And then he connects the priesthood of Christ to the new law. Notice what he says. Hebrews 7 verse 11, Therefore, if perfection were through the Levitical priesthood, he's not saying that God made it and it was something was wrong with it. It was perfect for the intent it was given, but perfection means what? Completion. He's saying the Levitical priesthood did not accomplish completion. No, notice what he says, for under it the people receive the law. So the Levitical priesthood is connected to the Old Testament law, the law of Moses. Keep reading. What further need was there that another priest should rise according to the order of Melchizedek and not according to the order of Aaron? Christ is the new high priest after the order of Melchizedek and not Aaron. Verse 12, for the priesthood being changed, what does the Hebrews writer say? The priesthood was what? It was changed. Notice what he says, of necessity there is also a change in what? The law. Go down to verse in, in this same context. Go down to verses um, 18 and 19, I believe it is. He says, For on the other hand, there is an annulling of the former commandment, that is the old law, doing away with it, making it no longer necessary, because of its weakness. It isn't weak because it's lesser than God made a mistake. It's weak because it was never designed to forgive sins or to bring one to salvation, but only to bring about the one who would bring salvation. And so he says, the annulling of the former commandment because of its weakness and unprofitableness. If we're living today and we're trying to follow the law when the blood of Jesus has already been freely given, it will not lead us to forgiveness of sins. Therefore, it's unprofitable. Verse 19, For the law made nothing perfect or complete. On the other hand, there is the bringing in of a better hope, which, notice, through which we draw near to God. We have hope and draw near to God today by the priesthood of Christ not the Levitical system. We have hope and draw near to, Christ, to God today through the law of Christ, not the law of Moses. And Galatians 6 refers to the New Testament as the law of Christ. And so this observation is pretty clear. If we are studying our Bibles and deriving our theology and biblical teachings without an understanding that, there is, that we are no longer under the Old Testament, but yet we are under the New Testament, which by the way, unless we were Jews, we were never under the Old Testament law. And I think that's worth noting. But failing to realize this puts us in a situation where we may be like some tempted to honor the Sabbath day as a day of rest, though the New Testament never teaches such, or tithing, or all of these things that we've already stated. Here's another observation, number five. Taking the Bible in context also means that we understand the context of that Bible book. And let me just note that this is the purpose of what we're trying to accomplish this year on Sunday evenings is give a, a, a very big overview, an eagle's eye view, if you will, of a Bible book, one book at a time. And it's just like that picture that I put on the screen. If I would have started with the picture of the Mona Lisa and then zoomed in and you saw, oh, we're going over the left shoulder and then zoomed in again to see the bridge and the man, it would have been far better a way to show you that detail, right? It's better to start big and work to details than it is to start with the details and just muddle around in the confusion. Does that point make sense? And the mistake that I often see, especially in church services that we make, is that 
the preacher oftentimes is the worst at it, and I'm po pointing at myself. I expect you to know something that I personally have studied. Maybe you've studied it, maybe you haven't. And I give you that small, that zoomed in view, and you have all these questions and confusion because you haven't seen the big picture yet. And so understanding the uh, context of the Bible book, um, let me just make this observation. You know that in the New Testament, every book except for six of those books, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the book of Acts, and Revelation, take those aside, but all the rest of the books of the New Testament can be read in one setting from beginning to end between two and 45 minutes. Have you thought about that? And I'm even being generous with that. I'm assuming that uh, it takes you about two or three minutes longer to read than what the slowest version of the audio Bible is giving you. And so that's really not a whole lot of reading. I mean, I've got kids that'll sit there for three hours and read something that they're greatly interested in. And even if you take a big book in the Old Testament, like the book of Genesis, and if you were to put it on the slowest speed possible on the, on the audio Bible, it would take three 50-minute sessions, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, doing less than an hour of reading, to read through the entire book of Genesis. You know what that tells me? And by the way, there are some books in the Bible that are not meant to be read that way. Psalms. Psalms are short because they can be read all at once. Not the whole 150 Psalms, but one Psalm at a time. That's more devotional based reading. And so you know that the epistles of the New Testament, what does epistle mean? Letter. And if you were to receive a letter from a good friend in the mail and you got it out, would you break up the reading of that letter into 15 little periods of reading? I'm going to read line one today, line two. We wouldn't do that, would we? Nor was that the intent of the letters, the epistles of the New Testament. They were meant to be read before the congregation and before individuals all in one setting. That helps us to better get the context of the whole book. Can't tell you how many times in this past year of reading the New Testament, because of how we read it all at once like that, that uh, I would read a familiar passage and think, you know what? That passage doesn't mean at all what I always thought it meant. When I read it in this context, I can see now that the way I understood that was actually out of context. And so when I'm trying to look at what a passage means, here's some questions to ask. I'll go down the list very quickly. Is this Old Testament or New Testament? It's important based on past thoughts that we had. Um, is this the patriarchal age, the Mosaic age, or is it the Christian age? Is this speaking to Jews or Gentiles or a combination of both? And that's very important in many of these New Testament letters. Who was it written to? to by who was it, uh, to whom was it written and by who was it written? What was about, if we can tell or get close, what was about the time it was written and where was it written from and to what region was it written to? What type of literature is it? Is it narrative? Is it dialogue? Is it poetry? Is it highly symbolic, like apocalyptic language? All of that is important. What is the historical setting? What is the social and political climate of the day? When I'm reading the book of Revelation, it's important to know that they were under persecution by the Roman government. Does that inform me on how to interpret the book of Revelation? Most certainly it does. And when I'm reading that Paul is writing, let's say, to the churches of Galatia, to Christians, to churches that were comprised of Jews and Gentiles, well, now when I read that there was a portion of Jewish Christians in the group who were trying to teach the law of Moses as still necessity, it makes sense now because I understand that context. And so I think all of that is important. Again, this is part of the benefit of these book summaries. Two more points and the lesson will be yours. I think it's also important to understand the surrounding context. I've given this example before, but let me give it again. can't tell you how many times through the years I have heard, and I continue to hear people say, and if I may be so bold as to say in the past two weeks, I've heard this uh, statement made about this passage, although two times recently I've mentioned it in a sermon. So that lets me know I need to keep preaching things over and over and over again, which, by the way, I need to hear things over and over and over again, too. But you have probably at some point heard Matthew 18 and verse number 20, which says this, For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. You have probably heard that passage applied to the context that, well, this is the minimum number of people we need in order to have a worship assembly. 
Well, when you go back and read the surrounding context of Matthew 18, you read, it doesn't mention worship at all. It's actually talking about correcting a sinning brother, and you go to him in private, you go to him with a witness, you take it to the church, and uh, when it talks about in that context, where two or three or more I am there in the midst of them. And so that's just one example of looking at the surrounding passage of a given context. What point has the writer been talking about? What is he about to discuss? And in addition to that, it's as practical as this, what do the verses before it and the verses after it have to say? Pretty common sense. Here's a final observation. And that is, in order to take the Bible in context, it is important to understand the difference between what applied to the original audience and what applies to us today. I see people get in trouble with this all the time, and I have done it several times myself. In this devotional style of reading the Bible, there is a purpose for that. If you want devotions from the Bible, I'd recommend the book of Psalms. If you're reading the rest of Scripture like a devotional or a feel-good, I would recommend don't do that because it leads to false teaching and it leads to confusion. And that approach to Bible study has led to a lot of false doctrines, and oftentimes it's been by not understanding this point that I'm trying to make here. For instance, we read of apostles in the first century in the New Testament, but if we read the Bible in its context, we know that there are no longer apostles today. But are sometimes people confused by this and call their religious leaders apostles? Yeah, sometimes that happens. Another example of this I'm not going to go into because we've talked about it on multiple occasions is the law of Moses. Obviously, we're not under Levitical worship or the Sabbath or tithing or any of that, but some people still try to take us there because they fail to realize what applied to them and what applies to us. And another example of this could be miraculous spiritual gifts such as tongue speaking and the and miraculous knowledge and prophecy of being able to predict or know things without having studied it. And this did exist in the first century, but often people will read this and take what applied to them and just assume that it applies completely to us, ignoring that 1 Corinthians 13, 8 through 10 says that tongue speaking knowledge and prophecy will cease when that which is perfect comes. And I believe that is a reference to the completed revelation. And there are many other examples that could be given. Let me end on this note and just say that when, when we don't take some of these steps, here's what it leads to. It leads to someone saying, well, you don't have to be baptized to be saved because Jesus saved the thief on the cross and he wasn't baptized. What's the problem with that based on what we just discussed? Well, I would add a practical note first. I don't know that the thief on the cross wasn't baptized. Not that that's even important. Two, biblical baptism as we know it was not yet in effect yet, right? The only baptism that existed when he died was the baptism of John, and that was not for an alien sinner to become, to be put in Christ. And in addition to that, I would just make this note that Jesus had the prerogative to do whatever he wanted to do. He forgave sins all the time. But the bigger point in this discussion is this, and you know what it is, right? The thief on the cross did not live in the church age. Repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins is taught in the church age. The thief on the cross, though in the story of Jesus, and that's recorded in the New Testament, he lived under the Mosaic age. Or if he was a Gentile, in the patriarchal age, which would overlap there, I believe. Though I don't know if I can prove that definitively. And so with that being said, we understand that context does indeed matter. And I know what, if I'm in your shoes, and I take myself back before having really considered a lot of this, here's my thoughts. Well, preacher, that's a whole lot of work just to read the Bible. You know, that's a whole lot of boxes to check. I would suggest to you that it happens very naturally if we simply pick up the Bible, start reading it, and the more familiar with this book we get, the more intuitive these steps become, don't they? You know, I don't know the story of, well, I don't know, n name, name a piece of literature. I don't I've never read the Chronicles of Narnia. Probably need to. It sounds like a good story. But the only way to really know how to navigate that story is if I do what? Pick it up and start reading it. And I, I've never read the Harry Potter series. But if I picked it up and read it, I would then be able to discuss with you in context the events that took place. And I happen to have seen the movie, so that probably doesn't hurt a whole lot either. 
You see the point that I'm making, right? It isn't to try to make Bible study systematic for the purpose of just making it complicated. It isn't to make it harder than it has to be. I'm simply trying to point out these seven steps we will probably do pretty naturally. It doesn't hurt to keep them in the back of our minds and apply these before we draw biblical conclusions uh, without first looking at it in its context. I don't want to be taken out of context, do you? And so God is giving us a self-portrait saying, this is who I am. This is what I've done for you. This is how I want you to live in response to what I've done for you. I don't think it's any more complicated than that. So I would hope that all of us would have as a goal in this new year, in this stage of our Christian lives, to read and understand the Bible better. I look at the Bible as more, you know, I don't look at Bible study as, well, let me take a course in theology. That's not what I look, I don't see the Bible in that way. I see it as the one who loves me more than anything else, Jesus Christ, wants to have a close relationship with me. Here's the avenue of achieving that close relationship. So go and read and study. If I can help in any way, let me know. I hope the lesson has been somewhat informative and beneficial. If you're here and want to start this new year as a child of God, come back to Him or come to Him in, in, an, in an initial response. Do so with faith, repentance, confession, and baptism. Will you come as we stand and as we sing? Psalm 876. Oh, they work with projector. 876.